hard to stop. I was enjoying that so much. Um, you may know that as Shaggy from uh, Scooby-Doo. Um, I was thinking about him recently because I um, looked in the mirror. <laughs> anyway, um, here we are for another session of uh, Scooby-Doo. No, here we are for another session of World History with me, Senor Grande. Today we are going to talk about Cuba. Um, so I'm going to share the screen again, this time not with my pal Scooby. Um, and let's see what we got here. Um, that's uh, so the wrong thing right there. Yeah. Okay. Once again, another high tech adventure with me, Mr. Grandy. Say, so we are going to get deep into Cuban history. Um, we've got a lot to say. I'm going to talk fast as always. We are going with our uh, continuity uh, across Latin American history from the Haitian Revolution to the Mexican Revolution, through the coup in Guatemala, now to Cuba, and next week to Venezuela. Uh, and I'm calling this week from Conquest to Castro. Um, that's the Cuban flag, as you may uh, have assumed. Let's. Um, Move this down a little bit here. So uh, just keep in mind our hierarchy that we have established now for several weeks, uh, going all the way back to pre-quarantine days, um, that uh, Latin America, again, as uh, modern Latin America has been established by the land, labor, and race hierarchy or stratification system uh, brought by uh, the Spanish, Portuguese, and others, uh, then bringing the indigenous people and Africans into that uh, status system, which still persists in some form today. Um, come down, come here, here we go. All right, um, uh, the next in that, uh, in that uh, pattern is the fact that uh, these countries in Latin America all became independent from Europe, uh, but increasingly fell under uh, American uh, dominance. Uh, following that then uh, were uh, patterns of revolution, uh, falling into dictatorship, sometimes a right-wing dictatorship supported by the United States, other times left-wing dictatorships, as we'll see with um, Cuba and Venezuela, uh, back to revolution and repeat. Um, also in our pattern is uh, left-wing anti-Americanism. We began to see that uh, growing in the Cold War and this sense of anti-imperialism as the United States becoming a more powerful imperial force in the Western Hemisphere of the Americas, uh, there became stronger contingents and communities uh, that identified as anti-American and anti-imperial. Um, uh, and that collective memory, that collective memory of dictatorship uh, persists all across the Americas. Uh, my mouse is not working when I share the screen. That's a bummer. All right, early uh, Cuban history. So this is going way back before um, what we know now as Cuba, uh, the conquest of the Americas. Columbus uh, arrived in uh, what we now call Cuba in 1482, and he immediately claimed that for Spain as a, as a colonial possession. So for 500 years, more than that, uh, Cuba has uh, fought off this uh, conquest uh, identity. Uh, they began to import slaves in 1526. Uh, for a brief interlude, the English uh, had uh, held on to Cuba, uh, and during this short period, I think about a year, they, they uh, had a massive increase in the importation of slaves from Africa. That pattern then persisted after the English uh, departed. Uh, and in exchange uh, for Florida, uh, which Britain took as part of its American colonies, it gave Spain back uh, Cuba. Uh, but Cuba, as I mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, Spain, as I mentioned, began to intensify the acceleration of slaves, mostly for sugar production. You've heard that, you know that already, just as in with Haiti. Um, and by doing so, they retain the loyalty of the peninsulares, the wealthy uh, landowners back in Europe, and the criollos, who were the wealthy slaveholding uh, population of Europeans in the Americas. All right. 
Okay, moving ahead. Um, sugar and slavery uh, is uh, one and the same. That bond uh, was absolutely essential to the success or the failure, depending on your perspective, of the transatlantic slave system. Um, it was, you know, slaves did all sorts of jobs, um, but the number one most important um, labor that slaves conducted for economic purposes was to sweeten uh, the food of Europeans and to sweeten their teas with um, the importation of sugar. A sugar worker, particularly in a place like Cuba, uh, which was a, uh, the ideal uh, climate for sugar growing, uh, a sugar worker would work 20 hours a day during a harvest and production season. So that's not the whole year. Uh, the, the conditions are unbearable. I'm not gonna try to describe those now because it wouldn't even come close. Uh, and it's not one that any of us could imagine. Um, with constant whipping, with intense heat, uh, mosquitoes, uh, tropical uh, humidity, um, the, burn, the uh, broiling of the sugar cane was in an incredibly hot environment inside of a hot environment. Uh, and the logic there was to work them to death rather than to feed and house them during the off season, right? They'd have these uh, lame workers sitting around doing nothing during the non-sugar uh, plantation, the sugar uh, harvest time. And so instead of having them uh, do nothing for several months, they just worked them to their deaths and then wouldn't import more. It was like an unlimited supply in the view of the Europeans. And um, this is the paradox of the Enlightenment that I've talked about before, right? The monarchs permitted merchants and plantation owners uh, more freedom to trade. Uh, they would allow them to accumulate their own profits rather than avoid paying high taxes to the crown and sending a lot of their profits to the crown so they could trade with whomever they want. That was the uh, sort of Adam Smith enlightenment idea of a free economy, but it did not recognize the freedom and the rights, the political rights and aspirations of the Africans and their descendants. So this real mixture of enlightenment for some and not for others that we've talked about before. All right, now the Haitian Revolution is gonna have an interesting impact on Cuba. Uh, in 1804, when Haiti gains its independence, many of the whites fled the island. Uh, you may remember Jean-Jacques Dessalines uh, essentially gave whites an ultimatum, stay and be killed or get the hell out, oops. Um, so uh, many of them fled to nearby Cuba, some with their slaves, and some then went ahead and set up plantations of their own uh, in Cuba, which again, boosted and bolstered the Cuban economy. Um, slaves though also brought their own ideas. Remember slaves as agents. We often talk about slavery as slaves as victims. Uh, they are agents. They were agents in their own freedom in Haiti. They were agents in rebellion and resistance here all across the Americas, including here in the United States. They brought with them revolutionary ideas and fervor uh, that had been brewing in Haiti, that exploded in Haiti, uh, and they brought that uh, to Cuba with them. Um, the Haitian sugar industry was nearly destroyed uh, as a result of the revolution. And we might, you might remember that, um, that Toussaint Louverture wanted slaves to go back to the plantation, not as slaves, but as productive workers. And the slaves basically said, uh-uh. Um, they burned and destroyed uh, much of the plantations, which gave Cuba a economic uh, advantage because now they did not have to compete with Haiti and, and sugar is gonna become that much more important in Cuba. This is all important because um, we're going to see that resentment, that class and race resentment uh, begin building here. Well, it's been building for a couple hundred years by this point. Um, and and um, this, uh, but throughout the 19th century, uh, increasingly, um, the Americans took a larger and larger role in the, uh, in the Cuban uh, industry. Um, they provided technicians. Uh, people who could work the machines, um, economic advice, so on and so forth. So that is really the story of the United States in the 20th century, 8th, 19th, and 20th century. It's increasing involvement in Latin American affairs and diminishing involvement of Europeans as the, Europe, as the Americans wanted it that way. All right, American ascendants in the region then. Uh, we already have reviewed many times the Monroe Doctrine in 1820, which essentially said that the United States uh, declare that no Europeans may really interfere with Latin American affairs. That's America's, uh, United States uh, determination. Spanish-American War happened uh, about 80 years later, 1898. Uh, United States becomes an official imperial, Euro, uh, imperial power, much like Europeans had been doing in Europe, uh, sorry, in Africa and Asia. Uh, now, if you really want to be broad about your definition, you could say that Americans were, had, been, had been imperialists as they moved across the West, uh, conquering Native American populations. But in any case, 
uh, Puerto Rico becomes uh, free of Spain, Guam becomes free of Spain, the Philippines becomes free of Spain, all those, in all those territories, they clamored for the Americans to come help liberate them. The United States, of course, represented uh, republic and democracy, uh, and the United States said, yes, we will come to your aid and free you. Cuban uh, rebels did the same. Americans were on their soil fighting side by side. And then Spain left. And the Puerto Ricans and Cubans assumed that the United States would say, adios. Rather, instead, they stayed. They stuck around. Uh, and in the Philippines, that led to a new war. Now the Filipinos began fighting against the Americans. It was there the Americans began to use what was called the water torture, which uh, they revived again uh, in the war on terror against the Iraqis um, to great shame. All right, so the Cubans now um, are under American control for a few more years. Um, the United States then pledges to support Cuban independence. Yeah, whatever, as I read in my notes. Instead, the United States um, writes the Platt Amendment in 1901. So that allowed Cuba to become more or less independent, uh, but always within reach of United States approval. Um, the United States withdrew its military, um, but wrote this Platt Amendment uh, as part of American law, as a continuity with the Monroe Doctrine, and also inserted it into the Cuban constitution, which the Americans wrote. It's not the same constitution today, um, which included uh, that the United States may intervene whenever it wanted. Imagine having that in your constitution that a foreign power could intervene whenever they want. This is high imperialism. Um, and that Cuba must lease a couple naval bases to the United States. One of those that the United States still holds on to, that's Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and that becomes infamous after 9-11. Um, I mentioned that the United States fought uh, against Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere in the war on terror. Many of the people they caught on the battlefield were then imprisoned at Guantanamo Bay, which is an American possession on the island of Cuba, in the country of Cuba, which was communist and a sworn enemy of the United States. Uh, but of course, Cuba was not strong enough to push the Americans out. For the Americans, this was a really uh, strategic location, not only for uh, refueling their ships, but for keeping watch over the Caribbean. All right. Oh, etc. Yeah. All right. All this is building up to great tension and uh, frustration. Uh, that's going to lead to the American, the Cuban Revolution of 1959. All right. Prior, uh, prior to that, a guy named Fulgencia Batista, uh, had, who had been a uh, military um, uh, official, became the general, ran for president, uh, becomes president, leaves president, and then later comes back to be a dictator. So he's a military officer and then elected president between 1940 and 44. After that, he retires, moves to Florida for a while where other Cuban uh, communities had been growing. Then decides he wants to be president again. He runs in 1952. It becomes clear that he's not going to win. And so he says, to heck with it. I'm just going to take over the government uh, in a coup. Uh, and he organizes with some other military officers to do just that and becomes a pretty harsh dictator between 1952 and 1959. Guess who backs him? Of course, the United States, um, because the United States had corporations in Cuba, like in other places we've described, Mexico, Guatemala. The United States wanted to protect those corporations and have them profit immensely, uh, regardless of who was in power and regardless how they ruled. So Batista uh, was a corrupt, um, wealthy, uh, plutocrat, uh, a little bit like Porfirio Diaz, but worse, uh, establishes dict this dictatorship in Cuba. He suspends the constitution. Uh, he destroys individual liberties. Uh, he, um, uh, you know, exacts massive violence on on uh, anyone he uh, uh, identifies as an opponent. Tortures people. Engages in public executions against protesters and destroyed the rights of laborers to uh, protest their working conditions. Remember, those laborers were part of that long stratified hierarchy, uh, still working in sugar plantations, technically not as slaves, but under brutal conditions. All right, uh, uh, Bautista aligns with the wealthy landowners, many of them foreign, many of them Americans, uh, like oil companies and others. Um, and he promotes those corporations. He also brings in the mafia to run the casinos, the American mafia, uh, the drug trade, the sugar plantations. It's just a massive den of corruption and uh, profits that were uh, doled out in a highly unequal fashion. Uh, the repression became too great. And so when uh, Castro arrives with his revolution, uh, he's welcomed by many. 
Um, but uh, Batista becomes so corrupt that he even loses American support. And in fact, initially, the United States uh, backed uh, Fidel Castro, who was not yet a communist, to overthrow the Batista regime, which Castro amazingly does with a small band of, um, of rebels. Uh, you can see him in the picture there, uh, looking uh, off into the distance of a communist future. Uh, to his left is Che Guevara, who is Argentinian. Che Guevara is kind of a little bit like uh, Simon Bolivar from the 1800s. He traveled all across the Americas, uh, waging revolution, trying to bring socialism to the places uh, he arrived at. He's going to stick around Cuba for a while and become a very important figure in the Cuban Revolution of 1959. There's your key date to know, 1959. All right, Castro. Uh, he's initially gonna try to overthrow the Batista regime in 1953. He and a bunch of his um, comrades are caught, they're jailed. They're eventually released in an amnesty. He promptly goes to Mexico where he links up with Che Guevara and they plot the next phase of their revolution, which will happen six years later. Uh, in fact, he's exiled to Mexico. Um, 1959, he arrives again by boat. Uh, it's an armed group, just one group on a boat is gonna take over this island. Uh, they end up in the Sierra Maestra Mountains where they wage this guerrilla war. Now this is really uh, in some ways reminiscent of 10 years earlier in China when, um, when Mao Zedong uh, on the Long March, which we haven't talked about yet, is going to go from village to village, exciting the peasants, getting them riled up, to fight and wage revolution. So this is a key time for uh, Castro and Guevara to enlist the support of peasants who were suffering, who were miserable, who were repressed, uh, who were exceedingly poor, who were illiterate, um, and they knew it. <laughs> uh, initially, as I said, uh, Castro has uh, American support um, until he takes over and begins to do the kind of thing that Arbenz and others does, which is to nationalize property, uh, foreign property redistributed to the country, or at least to the government, uh, without compensating these American corporations and wealthy Cuban landowners. Uh, and then shortly after that, Cuba begins to align hard with uh, the Soviet Union. So as the notes say, in technical language, yo, the Cold War is on, uh, said with no irony whatsoever. Uh, the Soviets uh, pledge, not just in Cuba, but elsewhere, to, su to support uh, national liberation struggles worldwide, just as the Americans had supported, uh, had, had uh, declared that they were going to support democracy worldwide. Well, we know the United States and the Soviet Union were really fighting the Cold War, were really looking to expand their empire. They weren't so concerned with democracy, rights, and freedom. Um, but Castro uh, willingly and happily took their support and aligned strongly with the Soviet Union. As you'll see in some of the video, I've included the Soviets will provide tanks and armor and weapons and military support and technical expertise uh, on and on. Okay, um, let's see, the Cuban revelation uh, continues uh, with uh, many plots. The United States is gonna back plot after plot, not only to kill Castro, uh, but to overthrow him. You can see on the top right there, we'll talk about uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, on the bottom right is uh, Castro holding the hand of Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union uh, in the 1950s. All right, uh, we'll see a short video, you'll see a short video, it's about three minutes long, of Sergei uh, Khrushchev, who is Nikita's son, talking about uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hold tight. Okay, uh, Bay of Pigs, so 1961, April 1961, trained by the Americans, um, the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion is a group of 1,400 Cuban exiles. These are Cubans who had fled the island uh, when Castro took power, had always wanted to come back. They were middle class or more and believed that uh, they were owed compensation for their properties uh, and for their loss of their great country. My grandma, uh, who lived to 100, died about, um, uh, well, eight years ago or so, um, you know, when she was much younger, uh, she would talk about, uh, she lived in Florida. Oh, it was so great back in the day when we could go to, uh, to uh, Cuba. It was 90 miles away. We could take a boat there, hang out in the casinos, come back that night. It was a lovely time. Well, the Cubans were suffering. I don't think she spent a whole lot of time in the countryside. In fact, I know that to be true. So Cubans were riled up. 
Uh, but many were also upset. Many thought they didn't like Castro. They didn't like communism and they didn't like being under the influence of the Soviet Union. So it, the island is divided for sure. Enough so that uh, exiles would gather arms, uh, risk life and limb, uh, be trained by the United States in a CIA led secret invasion um, that failed. Uh, they were imprisoned, many of them sent back. Um, uh, beyond that, the uh, United States engaged in something called Operation Mongoose, a very clever name for whatever reason. Um, it, it was just years and years of sabotage, attempts at assassination, uh, trying to plant exploding cigars with uh, Castro's secretary. Uh, they were never able to assassinate, assassinate exploding pens. It was very James Bond-like in the Cold War there. Uh, Castro was the ultimate survivor. Um, he was a dictator. Um, but as we can see from the Operation Mongoose and the Bay of Pigs, he had real evidence that the United States was willing to invade and overtake the island. And that's going to be absolutely key in the Cuban Missile Crisis. From Castro's mind, right, not only was he always trying to bring in more Soviet support, but he thought there was always a risk that Americans would invade and take over Cuba. It was real. It was a daily reality uh, for Fidel Castro. Like him or not, he had some legitimate concern about American invasion. All right, leading up to the 1962 then, your other key date, um, Cuban Missile Crisis. Perhaps some would consider this the 13 most dangerous days in all of human history. Um, let's, talk a let's look just briefly at the history of atomic weapons and their use leading up to 1962. Um, so of course, the United States uh, went first. Uh, in fact, last, the only time that uh, atomic weapons have been used, aside from the uh, dozens and dozens of tests that have gone on, uh, were in Hiroshima and Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 that helped bring uh, World War II in Asia to an end in an extremely brutal way. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, in a couple of weeks or so when we start talking about Asia. Um, so the use of those bombs certainly intimidated the Soviet Union, which did not yet have that same technology. We are just at the end of World War II, at the beginning of the Cold War. The Soviets and Americans are heating up in their competition, uh, in their arms race. So the use of those bombs both freaks out the Soviet Union, but it also gets them uh, kicking to accelerate their development of their own nuclear bombs, right? Their own atomic weapons. Uh, the UN nuclear program uh, certainly accelerated in the Cold War to the point of the 1980s. We had well over 10,000 nuclear devices, um, a little bit redundant, you could say. Um, in 1952, the United States developed and tested a much more powerful bomb, a thousand times more powerful than the bomb that exploded, the bomb that exploded, a thermonuclear weapon. Um, the Soviets are going to gain their version of that in 1953. Um, now, this is designed as a deterrent. It's not designed to use. It's designed as a showpiece. The United States will test it. They'll make sure the world knows about it, and they'll let everyone know, uh-uh, don't even think of going to war against us because we have this. And if push comes to shove, we'll use it. So it's a crazy logic, the logic of deterrence, that the United States and Soviet Union will have so many weapons that no one would dare use them. Uh, unfortunately, no one did. But it became very close to that in 1962, extremely close. Uh, perhaps I wouldn't be here talking right now had that weapon been used or weapons been used in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So um, 1954, the United States uh, has its, its largest test ever called the Castle Bravo test. And I'll, uh, it's, it's, on the, it's in the Marshall Islands, which was also under American control after World War II. Um, it's an atoll, meaning it's sort of a collection of islands um, out in the Pacific uh, called the Bikini Atoll. That is where the bathing suit name comes from, Bikini Atoll, after the Americans began to hang out there with their troops uh, on R&R uh, &R during weekends of rest from World War II. Um, so some of the islanders were forcibly removed. They did not know why. Um, others were left and exposed to massive radiation as a result of this test. Uh, the, uh, the forecast had been that the wind would be blowing, be blowing one way. The United States did the test. The wind changed uh, and then blew uh, massive doses of radiation on um, the people. This is by no means the only exposure. Uh, from nuclear testing that people out in the Pacific uh, and in Western United States uh, <clears throat> were exposed to as a result of nuclear testing. Um, 
it's a thousand times, this bomb was a thousand times more uh, powerful than Hiroshima. In fact, it surprised the scientists even. Um, the mushroom cloud, you'll see an image of that in just a minute, was four and a half miles wide, just from one explosion. And it was 130 feet, 130,000 feet high. It left a crater on the ocean floor more than a mile wide and 250 feet deep. So pretty powerful. Um, it uh, a, rise in uh, a rise in the registry of radiation around the world actually was uh, noted as a result of this uh, nuclear debris or fallout uh, fell in a 7,000 square mile rain, uh, radius. Uh, again, in the, out in the Pacific Islands, Pacific Islands looked like snow falling um, and kids would play in it and of course be exposed. Um, one famous incident from this was a Japanese fishing boat, um, which was out near the um, blast zone, uh, caught a massive uh, blast of radiation. Uh, they did not know what was going on. Now, you have to remember, this is just nine years after Americans dropped atomic bombs on Japan and um, just completely transformed the, the population as a result of that, um, that, uh, those episodes. So now here you see a Japanese fish full of fish. It brought the fish back to market and then pumped those fish into Japanese markets, selling radiated fish until Japanese authorities went and tried to track down all the fish and destroy them uh, full of radiation. Um, and some of those sailors uh, all uh, experienced uh, radiation poisoning. So a very sensitive and upsetting episode for the Japanese um, after World War II. Um, this is what it looked like. You can see that mushroom cloud forming uh, up, I think you might say, in the stratosphere. Sending a massive blast wave. All right, leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. The Soviets uh, beat the United States to space by launching uh, Sputnik. Uh, the first satellite to um, to um, orbits the word uh, <laughs> around uh, the Earth, uh, further accelerating the space race and the arms race. This, of course, freaked out the Americans. Um, they were also developing long-range missiles. Now, their missiles could not hit D.C. or New York, but from Cuba, they certainly could. So, uh, in that year, um, the United States. Uh, had detected with spy planes, these called U-2 spy planes. Uh, they had taken some photos and had uh, determined that there were Soviet long-range missiles being um, set up in Cuba. Now, the United States wanted to counteract those missiles, um, Soviet missiles, by uh, planting um, a missile base in Turkey. Remember, Turkey, much closer to the Soviet Union than uh, any other part of Europe, uh, was a NATO country. Uh, and so uh, openly allowed the Americans to establish uh, military bases and uh, missile sites facing the Soviet Union. Uh, but the Soviets did not have any similar capacity. And so uh, you can see here the uh, imagery, the spy imagery that's from above um, with annotation that the uh, you know, intelligence people uh, put on those images to demonstrate that uh, indeed the Soviets had brought missiles uh, that could be armed with nuclear warheads and launched against the United States. Uh, the, so the American missiles had uh, put in Turkey in 1959. Uh, this is now just a two and a half plus years after that. Um, the first sighting is October 14th, 1962. Note the date, October 14th, 1962. Um, this is now becomes a very tense period because every minute uh, was a ticking time bomb, to use those words not so carefully, um, that the Soviets could launch missiles at the United States. And every minute, Kennedy, who was president, um, John F. Kennedy, had to uh, work with his advisor to determine, should we strike before they strike us? Are they going to strike us? Are they going to put nuclear warheads on those missiles or not? Um, the wrong move could launch us into nuclear war. Uh, not making a move could mean to our uh, massive destruction here in the United States. 
So very tense days. Uh, 10 days later, Kennedy uh, goes to the UN, shows these images um, as a way to try to pressure the Soviet Union to back down. He makes a speech on the 25th, right? This is just 11 days later now. Um, Khrushchev, uh, Nikita Khrushchev finally agrees 13 days later to remove the missiles invade Cuba and remove its missiles from Turkey. Um, but all along, Kennedy had to decide what to do. And you'll do in part of your exercise um, some of the thinking that Kennedy and his advisors had to go through. Okay. Um, you'll have a clip from the film 13 Days. It's a dramatization. Uh, it's about four minutes um, to think about, uh, to, to get in sort of the mindset of the uh, Kennedy advisors and what they were uh, deciding. Some said, Kennedy, you've got to strike, you've got to strike now before they do. Others said, hold off, let's try to negotiate and use diplomacy. You'll also watch a three-minute clip, as I mentioned, from Sergei Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev's son, basically saying that, you know, the American perspective on this was very different than ours. We didn't see this as a major provocation. Uh, we knew they were ahead of us. We knew they had better technology. We knew they had missiles in Turkey. Um, this is a bit of a deterrent, but, you know, we weren't thinking like they were thinking. So, you know, the Americans and Soviets did not have the same mindset in that 10, 13 days, but it could have gone to nuclear war. Okay, uh, again, you can see satellite imagery of that missile, those missile sites. Here's uh, the UN speech uh, with those images. Um, and uh, this was the projected range by American uh, CIA officials showing uh, Cuba in the center there. Um, let me see if I can get my, uh, my pointer there, right? showing uh, Cuba here in the center, and then uh, outer ranges of that missile. So they talk about Dallas, Washington, D.C., and New York could all be, uh, could all be hit. They would not be able to hit Seattle uh, in their estimation. Okay. Um, so how is it resolved? What's the impact? Uh, some people, again, consider that this might have been the 13 most dangerous days in uh, human history bringing the world almost to the brink of uh, nuclear warfare. Turkish missiles were removed. The, hot, the hotline was established that could be a direct call between the Soviets and the Americans to, um, to tamp down on any uh, future crises. Um, <clears throat> uh, but it also led to uh, the acceleration of the arms race. Uh, uh, but it kept the United States and the Soviet Union from going into a conventional war, that is soldiers on the ground. Um, that just uh, really wasn't possible anymore with nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Some people say this is Kennedy's finest moment. Um, Kennedy also, you know, accelerated American um, uh, war, the American war in Vietnam. So it's not like he just has this long record of peace, but in this case, he kept us out of uh, nuclear war in spite of what many of his advisors said, which was to strike first. Okay, having a little issue here with the PowerPoint, go. All right, so on to the Cuban Revolution then. Um, here's uh, a couple things to think about uh, when we think about Castro. It's not a straight up record of dictatorship or liberation. Um, he brought uh, literacy to that poor peasant population that I talked about earlier. He strengthened the role of women. You know, women were uh, soldiers in the revolution right alongside with men. Uh, he went way further than the women uh, who were solidaris in the Mexican Revolution. He sent doctors all over the world, still does, uh, to places like Haiti and other poor countries that need um, that need health and health care. Um, <clears throat> his global impacts um, uh, were also many. Keep in mind that this is a small island, uh, a tiny island with a small population, with a small economy, and yet it had an outsized massive impact disproportionate to its size. Um, he inspired social movements, socialist movements across Latin America, uh, also alongside with Che Guevara. Um, he was the symbol of resistance to American foreign policy. How was it the United States was never able to put an end to Fidel Castro, a uh, small leader on a small island? Um, he uh, resisted all the way through the Cold War and beyond. Um, he provided doctors and health care to poor countries, as I mentioned. He supported socialism and rebel movements around the world, especially in Angola in the 1970s. Uh, which um, neighboring South Africa had invaded. South Africa was under apartheid, a white racist regime, and it was projecting its power across the border in Angola. Uh, Castro sent troops there to resist, I think about 10 years, and eventually pushed back against uh, South Africa, um, established a socialist uh, government in Angola. Um, however, at the end of the Cold War, the Soviets were broke we talked about that back in person uh, a couple months ago. 
um, and can no longer support Cuba. Cuba now loses its lifeline. This little economy that had been under a trade embargo for decades, the United States did not allow any of its allies to trade with Cuba. Um, it now, its economy now is really broken without that lifeline of Soviet support. The uh, United States keeps the trade embargo going as long as Castro was in power, as long as it declared itself to be a socialist government, and its economy crashes. Um, Fidel Castro eventually dies, Brother Raul takes over um, until just a few years ago. Uh, and they are in permanent revolution, right? They continue to imprison their opponents. They continue to uh, prevent elections. Uh, exiles continue to flee, often on boats. Watch the video I, I included of people getting in these rafts, going at, uh, at great risk of their own. Uh, but they deem it a some people in Cuba. Of course, the uh, so socialist regime still has many supporters as well. Um, and again, it's outsized impact. Um, this small island has had a massive impact uh, on music and culture uh, around the world. We are going to be so fortunate to have a speaker next week, May 8th, uh, when Ned Sublet, uh, you'll see it in my notes, and I'll, in, uh, I'll message you more about that, is going to speak to us about the power and impact of Cuban music and its lineage and connection uh, to the African diaspora, beginning with slavery and then beyond. So um, I think that is the end of my slides here. Um, look closely at the document I've uh, posted on Canvas and um, I'll be in touch with you all. Take care. I'll see you soon.